The Datavana podcast, hosted by Alon Wax, features visionaries, leaders, and really smart people who join our hosts to converse about marketing, sales, operations, and everything that data ties together. We focus on practical examples, stories, and horror stories, centering around what data nirvana looks like and what the path is to achieve it. All right, Megan, welcome to the Data Vana Show. Amazing to have you here. How's your day? Hey, Alon. Great. Great to be here. So, you know, this show is a lot about talk about data and the fun stuff about revenue and go to market and all of that good stuff. But first of all, we want to talk about the people and your uh, our guests. So, of course, I can Google you, you go to LinkedIn, and we have a history together. We can go into that later. But first of all, the first thing we ask is about yourself. So, if you were not this revenue leader and great salesperson and amazing, uh, you know, person in the world of go to market, who would you be? So, can I answer that literally and then figuratively? You can answer it as any way you want. All right. So I think literally I love architecture and design and it's always been a passion of mine. I've renovated many houses. Um, absolutely just a passion of mine. And, um, and I love pre COVID global travel where you could see lots of great architecture and design um, and experiencing that. So I think um, if I wasn't doing this, that is, that is what I would be doing. And um, from figuratively, so um, I love Wonder Woman. She is fierce and she has awesome bracelets. And if you can <laughs> see behind me, I have had this for so long, about 10 years, um, long before the movies were popular. Um, my husband and I, my husband gave it to me. We were talking years ago about, I don't know if you remember the Amy Cuddy power poses. Yeah. So um, we talked about the power poses and it was, you know, who would you be if you're doing your power pose? And mine was Wonder Woman. So I've had this Wonder Woman statue. And every time I'm on a call, um, people are always asking me about it. So that would so be. I have to tell you, there are two things you just said in the last minute that are so Seinfeld. Do you know why? Seinfeld always has a uh, Superman figure in every Seinfeld episode. Oh, that's right. Everyone. And you have Wonder Woman. And the second thing is about the architect. George always dreams about being <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's and right. I love Seinfeld. I use it in B2B marketing all the time. Very funny. Like way too much than, than I should. You can ask everybody who's talking to me from Vickers <laughs> to everybody else. And I love it. Like, uh, it's the, you know, when you come and introduce yourself in a fake name, it's Acme Corp and I'm an architect. That's like George MO. So, <laughs> but it's not yours because you have a real job as opposed to George. Love Stanza, it. Stanza. All right. So I understand that. Um, by the way, COVID story. We literally moved in a year uh, into a project. Uh, we bought a new apartment in Manhattan and it took over a year for the approval and the COVID and everything, the construction to go. So I think renovation used to be fun and maybe uh -huh. one day will be fun, but not, in, not for me. Uh, no, I can tell you that I've always really enjoyed it. And this last one I'm actually standing in right now um, with actually workmen outside my door tell, I'm telling them to be, to be quiet. Um, because renovating during COVID has been a very difficult between the supply chains, the work availability, things shutting down. I, I feel your pain. That's like, that's a drink conversation. Yeah, yeah we need a few beers after this one. Okay. <laughs> well, talking about pain, you know, we, we'll switch the pain related go to market stuff. So, you know, on this show, we, what we try to talk about is why data is <clears throat> one of the things that's supposed to reduce pain for us, right? Enable right. us. So I'd love to hear just generally about your role and, why is data something that is really important to you? And then we'll get to like, why is data not perfect, right? Okay. So tell us. Um, so my role is the COO of Global Strategic Segments at SAP. So at SAP, that means that's the top of our go-to-market pyramid. So that's what we call our platinum customer unit, strategic customer program, and private equity. Um, it's a small number of customers and firms that make up a large percentage of our revenue. And we, we invest in those accounts much more heavily than obviously than, than in some of our other. We make outsized investments because we get outsized returns in those accounts. So data is very important. Um, everything we do, we look at our performance, we look at how we're tracking, we, when we, especially when we talk about go to market, um, it's, you know, we're very data driven. It's critically important. So, so. If you could maybe like, you know, this is not scientific, how much of decision making and stuff is experience and gut versus data driven today? Do you think in, for your role and others involved similar to you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Hmm. Percentage. I mean, yes. I would say, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think about a couple of recent examples. It's both. It's art and science. But I think a lot of it is data. Um, we have, you know, experience from what we know, it, you know, happens in the field and how engagement models work. But then we we look at a couple of new roles during our go to market planning period that just ended and we've started our new fiscal year started January 1st. Um, and a couple of new roles that we added, and it was extensively data driven. We did, um, you know, we did engage with our field on our region. Some I engaged with our regional leaders to sanity check, but the data was it was data driven, very data driven. It was um, down to, you know, for these two new roles, what do they do? You know, the RACI and roles or responsibilities, and then all the data behind it. It was the number of solutions. Um, that are in this this phase of of our engagement model that we're covering that the customer has. Um, where are they in the complexity of those solutions? Where are they in the adoption? That's all data. Where are they from a revenue spend model? You know, and then by region we had nuances. So very very data driven. Um, I'd say that was probably eighty percent data, twenty percent you know engaging with the field. Yeah, that's great. So you know, being data driven is what we're all trying to become. But in the age of Massive digital footprint and so many systems and 20 CRMs and 30 marketing channels and everything else under the moon and the sun. It still is, you don't even have one single view of the customer, even if you want to, or building it is hard. It needs to be agile and, and intent and all that. Tell us a little bit about why data is so important for you when you do your job and, and how does it help you guide you towards doing your job better? Yeah, um, so it's, I mean, it's critically important in terms of, so we've made a lot of acquisitions. So, I mean, and yes, as we do, you know, as we have obviously a plan and from an acquisition plan in terms of moving them onto our systems, but there's different, you know, timeline for that. So at any point in time, we have some of our acquisitions are not yet on uh, core central systems. So we're dealing, you know, with all of those challenges that any most companies have, unless you're, you know, starting your company tomorrow. Um, it, it's critically important because we're dealing with um, such a significant portion of revenue from a small number of accounts that the coverage that we have on those accounts, understanding at a very detailed level where we are in our penetration and the solution uh, portfolios and the sales bags of all of the different roles that we have from a go-to-market perspective on our accounts. It's very, very data-driven and, and it's critical. And not only that, I mean, we use it, it's not just from a planning perspective, it's how we run our business. And, I, and we're constantly managing all year to make sure that we have the coverage that we need. And if we don't have the coverage we need, what is the impact on pipeline and performance and attainment um, and, and our goals around strategic client engagement, which are phases that we use to determine the maturity of the relationship and where we're moving. Yeah, so, so if I can define for you this, you know, magic like wand or fairy dust or whatever, and you could instill it across all the hundreds of systems across, what would like the nirvana, like the utopic state of data, data vana, as it's called, be? Yeah. What would it, would it be? Some people say it's like, I don't need to look at data, I just get inside. Some people say... Right. It's all the data in the world. I want to have it in my fingertips and download in Excel and do everything. Everybody is different. What would it be for you? Um, no, to me, it's about, um, I don't want, I, I don't think, I mean, we're not at a point, I don't want a system telling me what to do. I mean, there's certain functions within a company where, where we should use data to tell, to literally tell the user what to do, you know, PO invoice matching and things like that. But when we're talking about things like sales strategy and go to market across a very, you know, small number of accounts that impact a significant amount of our revenue. I wouldn't, I don't want it telling me what to do, but I think it's about having the right data. It's more without having to manually engage with the data that everyone has the data they need role-based to do their job and make the decisions at their fingertips. And we actually have gotten there in a number of areas, but you know, like any company, we have our challenges and a lot of it comes from that constant acquiring, divesting, um, of companies and, and some of those, and then the changes that happen just as part of doing business. And then, of course, we all had to pivot during COVID with, you know, are we, how is our business changing? What do we need to pivot? Yeah, so it, I think agility is a very important piece here. And if you don't have the right reporting and the right information, it doesn't have to be perfect, but leading indicators, let's start with right. that. If you have that in place across the main points of the system, i.e. the funnel of the, of the sales, 
the status of an account because you're probably going into more accounts that have lended or multiple lended mm-hmm. and you want to look at it as strategic. Mm-hmm. Without that, agility is extremely hard because then like, okay, is usage down because of the, uh, the customer service organization is doing less? Right. Right. Or is used right. to down because they're now moving to a different channel because they're digital and yes. their in-person yeah, stuff is done. So um, tell us a little bit about that, maybe about data yeah. horror or other elements of it. Well, so we do, um, well, I have a, a horror story that's not from my current role, but from my current role, I mean, we look at renewals, um, you know, we look at in very detailed level, is it by a product issue? Is it by a coverage issue? Um, you know, across all of our um, so in my segments, they are all customers. So they are already substantial customers, but we have such a large solution portfolio. We are landing in some areas of the company. We are consuming and expanding and adopting in other areas of the company. Um, so we're really looking at at any given point, we're trying to understand where the challenge is. If we have a, something dropping off from a consumption or adoption or renewal, is it a product issue? Is it a coverage issue? Is it a person issue? When you're dealing with such um, large accounts, you know, the amount, the impact is significant from a handful of accounts. So trying to understand those nuances, we start, um, we, all, we always start with data. Okay. I mean, obviously, uh, data makes the world go around, right? So, so tell me a little bit like, um, so who's the right and left hand here? Is there like a centralized team who owns the data? You can say that everybody does, but of course, yeah. the system owns it and we're the slave to the system, but that's a different conversation. Yeah. So we have, um, from an operations standpoint, we have um, global centralized um, operations teams from a functional perspective. So global sales operations and global marketing operations teams. Um, and then I, we have a team embedded in our business. Um, we have to have partners from those teams that know our business very well um, and interface back into those teams and giving our requirements when we have unique needs sometimes that are different than the next, you know, our, you know, 200 accounts versus the next, you know, 300,000 accounts might have a different need, but, you know, we're equally important from a revenue standpoint. So, yeah, every, every, every platinum or strategy company yeah. is more important than another but every small one if it's well we have well, to serve all of them because volume is critically important net new um is definitely critically important to our growth so you know those teams have to serve everyone um which is why i do like having um some operations embedded in the business um i know that you know i know i know that may not be the answer you want to hear but i think that you have some amount of control over that and they uniquely understand your business whereas you know global operations has to serve you know, all of our segments because yeah, they're all, all important. It's always a debate. Should we have our own ops that helps us do things one to one, and we control it and give them yeah. more direction. Yeah. Versus centralized rev ops or business operations that is spread across and priorities come all the way from their leader and doesn't exactly. always align to the line of business. It's always a debate, and the second debate is always, well, is marketing and sales ops really talking to each other the same language, or do we have to get them into a room and time out yeah. all the time because we need to share with them? What yeah. are your thoughts yeah. on that? No, and yeah, no, I, I think that sales and marketing need to come closer together and, and be very close together in most organizations. I mean, my team works on a number of, of work streams um, with our marketing, uh, with our marketing partners um, to ensure that we're, we're working very closely together. Um, yeah, to your point of tying the hip and bringing them into a room, we can't, we have to do that virtually these days. <laughs> it's a challenge, you know, virtually it's, it's it's more efficient because you can always jump on a call. You can always get somebody. But I found that whiteboarding exercise and like really like that's why all these tools are coming together. Yeah. yeah. There's another 10 tools like this every week. Whiteboarding, flow charts, yeah, like, you know, yeah. diagram and drag and drop. And then everybody uses a different tool and I have to like collapse them all. I know. And it's learning the tools and the learning curve with that. Yeah. No, I know. We had actually, it's funny. We had the mural C- CEO at one of our, um, we had, we do an academy for our um, 300 global account directors and managing partners um, in September. And he joined and one of the people in our team, the way they were using mural during the session with him, he was like, that's really cool. I haven't seen that used that way yet. <laughs> yeah. I think this is uh, one of those spaces uh I, I, as a marketing person who does a lot of strategic, you know, it's planning and attack and flow. And I work a lot with RevOps. The whiteboarding is what I really miss. Small room whiteboarding, five yeah. to eight people max. Yeah. And that is one that's still hard for me 
yeah. on the virtual world. Doesn't matter what tool you give me. It's the experience of getting up, walking yeah. across the table, yeah. taking that dirty eraser that's making you choke with dust, yeah. doing an X on everything and scratching together and coming in with different colors. No, I, I agree. I think there's some, I think we've done a really good job with efficiency and most companies have in adapting to COVID. And in fact, I mean, I think it's probably created more meetings than we used to have, but we're more efficient, not mm-hmm. traveling. Um, but I do think there's something that it's really hard to replace certain functions. It's that when you're brainstorming on something with a whiteboard in a room, even though we have the digital tools, it's not quite the same. Everyone is in their own room with their own distractions. So that becomes a little bit difficult. And I think, you know, the, the, um, the social aspect, I think, is, is hard. You can't really recreate, you know, a uh, virtual happy hour is not the same as, as being, uh, you know, all being out to dinner. Yeah, it goes to like your measurement and then how you operate. Uh, yeah. how is, how's, how has it been? Like if you're working with like these really big companies and relationship is a big aspect of it, mm-hmm. it's, it's quite hard to be an inside sales team when you're not, you're definitely not an inside sales team. You're very yeah. much an outside sales team. Uh, how has it, how's this challenge been overcome? What do you guys do um, special? Yeah, I think, so I think it's been a challenge. So if you think about it, a lot of our people had, you know, they had, they were in, you know, they had an office at a lot of headquarters of these companies. They had a badge. I mean, that that's hard um, because they had so much engagement. They were almost, they were with their customer more than they were with our SAP teams. Mm-hmm. So big change with that. I think I actually feel at the beginning of this, I talked to our team and I said, I think we're really fortunate because we are really strategic to our these customer group that we deal with in our segments. So we were, are, we're having conversations and dialogues. You can't imagine it would be very difficult to try and get to someone you've never known before to start to have to start to have a conversation. Um, we, you know, we've been able to continue even to grow into new relationships and new areas of companies during COVID. So I think you know, we've been in in a unique position because I think, you know, everyone at the beginning of this was hard. It was scary. And I talked to, you know, I talked to my team and I said, guys, you know, we're in a really good place to help lead our customers, to help share what other customers are doing across the industries. And, you know, we did a lot of things like a lot of companies. We mobilized quickly. We did some CEO roundtables. I had the opportunity to moderate a, a roundtable with our CEO and CEOs of 10 different companies and really understand the challenges they were facing and share with them, you know, our experience and experience across our customers. So I think, you know, we did a lot of things uh, to try and quickly mobilize with COVID, but I think every company, it's a challenge. And I think the things that worked six months ago aren't working as well today because I think people are tired of looking at the screen. And so we have to be, you know, we have to think of new ways to engage. Definitely. I'm seeing this with a lot. It's uh, the round table aspect, and, and, but you need to understand, of course, not just the data, if you have a seat at the table already, you want to bring this person and that brings the next five people and that brings the next 10 people. Yeah. But you got to make sure that you have the right element and the right reporting. And you can't do an intimate round table of executives where you have 40 people. Right. That's not no, intimate. you can't. It's the that right number. Work no, you're, right. you're right. You can have two restaurants and split them, but that doesn't work today. So you can right. send them the wine, you can send them the thing, you can send them yeah. an experiential package. So I always divide it into the angle and the, and the anchor. The anchor could be probably your CEO mm-hmm. plus, you know, other people and a cool experience. But the, ang- yep. the but the angle has to be something interesting. Yeah. Like we Absol- don't just show no, up absolutely. anymore. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's finding those topics. And again, I think the topics that we were talking about six months ago are not the topics we're talking about today. We, we were talking about even going back in September, we were talking about the, the next normal. Now we're talking about the new normal or what's, what's, what's forward. And, you know, I think, you know, the tactics that worked and the engagement that worked, I think, you know, everything's moving so quickly. And if we don't get to get on a plane soon, you know, it's, it'd be yeah. interesting. Yeah, everybody needs a vacation or, or, or even a work related trip is healthy, but you know, let we'll survive at the winter first. So, um, uh, back to like, you know, a survival and horror and all that. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, data horror stories. That's one, one yeah. of the segments of this, um, this episode telling me anyone that you have in your career, the more horrific, the better. Of course, we <laughs> keep it like same. Yeah. So I was actually thinking about this and I think I tried to shut it out, to be honest. But um, in, in a previous life, um, I, ha- I was living, uh, living, I lived in Panama for a couple of years and did a lot of business in Central and South America and um, worked with a, a variety of clients. And we subscribed to data 
um, had, had a small team and subscribed to data from some certain feeds that gave us information around different private equity firms and some other things. But each project we would take on, we would need new data that was very industry specific or unique to the project. So in this case, we had a customer that wanted us to utilize a local firm um, to collect this data, which included um, some local data interviews and things like that. So we worked with this firm for about a month and we were in a hurry to package this up and get ready to start marketing this. And um, after about a month, they had um, created the data cubes and we were about to start the analysis. And we were told that the firm was financially insolvent. And so, and then, of course, this is uh, what lesson learned um, that they had used their own software. Um, and so, therefore, we couldn't just take the data and take it to someone else. So, it was an absolute nightmare. Ended up intense negotiations. Um, ended up getting them to finish the analysis with uh, our, our client had to give them more money, of course. Um, I guess what the nightmare was, at least we could, we didn't lose the data. If we had to start over again and lose an entire month, um, you know, a month lost plus another month, I, I mean, we would have, we actually would have lost the business completely altogether. So it was, it was a nightmare and definitely lessons learned on multiple fronts, like with any horror story. I think you always say, what could I have done better? And then you try and put it out of your mind when, this one was a lot of sleepless nights. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> it just shows that that having the right data, even though it's perfect data, perfect data, good luck. That's Nirvana. That's why we have a show. If you have the right data in place to support a, a hypothesis or to support leading and lagging indicators in order to drive these this decisions, if you don't have it in place, the lag of time, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like We'll talk about RevOps maybe soon. What does it mean to you and like this whole world of, of data operations, it still astounds me that data and operations and everything about sales ops and marketing ops isn't like sexy or cool and therefore mm-hmm. never gets uh, something to be a priority, especially in smaller or high growth companies. Mm-hmm. It's like, let's invest in leads because I can quantify leads. Let's invest in salespeople. Yeah. But if you don't invest in foundation, baseline, benchmarks, Reports, decision making, decision, what, what used to be called DSS, decision support systems. 15 years ago, it was like the thing. Now it's not. Right. It, how are you going to make decisions if you don't invest in data that, that supports your business? It's like you're going to hire. I love it when I, when I hear people say we're going to hire 20 sales people. Everybody's got a quarter, 75, 80%, and it's going to be amazing. Wow. What, what about <laughs> the things that help them? What do you think about that? What, what's your thoughts? No, I think, look, I think we have to give people the tools. I think, um, I think we, it's not just, we have to empower um, our selling organization with the right tools and the right data because most of their competitors have them. Um, I think, you know, the more complex the account landscape is, the more important um, that becomes. And, you know, we do, it's, it's, you know, a lot of value selling. It's about benchmarking. It's about, you know, what, how are, you know, their industry peers and how are they performing or not performing in addition to data around our white space and competitive intelligence and things like that. So we have to arm, um, I think, putting salespeople out there without giving them proper tools and data and insights into their accounts um, is, it, it makes it very difficult for them to succeed in this day and age, especially again, when we talk about like, Without COVID, how are they getting unique insights? They're not there every day walking the halls. I mean, how are we giving them insights that they need into their accounts? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, the insights is, is what we need the data for. Uh, you know, one other thing, again, I'm jumping around with this podcast a little bit. We usually um, start covering a segment which is about this thing really like, you know, we don't get or this like um, acronym or this term really, really annoys us. Everybody starts looking at it so much and it's really not effective. It's like, uh, tell me, like, it's interesting for me in your business, which is a very different than uh, as people that are in high growth phase, but it's more mature mm-hmm. business that's really 10, 100 X for each account. Mm-hmm. W- what is that thing that you think people are stuck on or that acronym that really annoys you? Yeah, I think it's, oh, you know, HC or headcount in our world. So we just finished going through our go-to-market planning for FY21. We started the year for us, and I, and I kind of gave an understanding of, of our you know, strategic segments. Talking about um, the coverage model, we have, you know, 25 roles on an account and the ratios and things we need. Saying that we have a headcount on an account means nothing. It's about if we expect them to do a task, what is the percentage of, of FTE that we actually have? 
um, designate it to these uh, to each account and to a specific account based on the needs and what we profiled that that needs. So just saying, I think that's very misleading, um, even even across departments. Um, and we really dig into that um, in great detail because for our segments, it's critically important. Um, you know, having headcount on it, but you know, if that person has 40 other accounts, is not helpful to us when we need you know one third of a, an FTE focused on doing a specific task. Yeah, it's, it's, and it goes back to being able to really understand the quota and the assessment and scale and capacity. Uh, I use the term maturity model all the time. I know people who listen to me know, but there's a maturity model to everything. There's a maturity model to a salesperson having a $5 million or $10 million quota. And, then, and even if it's somebody who's very senior from a different company, they need to be ramped, relationship. Like mm-hmm. I, I do love it when... All right, we hired five amazing AEs who were rocking it in every other company and we're paying them a lot of money. This year is going to be on fire because it's like two quarters to go and we just hired them. And this is an enterprise strategic sale. It's going to be easy, right? Have you, well, you ever I, that? I think sometimes people don't recognize the amount of time that it takes to cultivate. So this gets back. It's, it's not, you know, there's a there's a ramp time and you need to know what that is in your business, in your industry, in your segment. And, you know, because, no, you know, there's there's uh, magic and then there's reality. Yeah. And it's all about and then there's luck. <laughs> but you can't count on luck and quantify it to, to attain a budget number with, you know, yeah, so the forecasting and the plan, again, we have to go by the data we have. Yeah. And then we can assess it, we can be conservative. So that's why I believe always in when you have all the all the orchestration of data and you have the reports and you have everything, that's great. But at the end of the day, to say like, here's the state of our business, green, orange, red, here's the range. Are we gonna make a hundred million or fifty seven million or forty? Right. Okay. You gotta give a range. Yeah. Uh, if you give one number like yep we go, we hire two people <laughs> that each gonna make Agreed. ten million a quarter. Like Agreed. that doesn't make sense. Agreed, so, so agreed. like, be conservative and then overachieve and then change your baseline accordingly, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. Tell me maybe a little bit what other thing we have, uh, our audience always asks me is about this uh, term of rev ops or operations. You studied a little bit before we talked a little about it, about having your own operational person to help you inside the line of business, but then also mm-hmm. having a centralized. Tell me maybe a little bit more about that. Uh, like the tools that you guys use and the systems, is that centralized? Do you have your own ones? How does it work? How do you prefer? Um, Yes, so primarily centralized. And then um, we have our own ops team embedded in the business that does some additional analysis. Um, But primarily most of our tools are centralized um, in the the company. And that's, that's when I was talking about the global sales operations and marketing operations. But then there's things that are nuances that, we need, you know, specifically for our segments. And so our team can, can do the analysis and pl- apply different dimensions to that. And then sometimes we do need some additional uh, data or usage of some additional tools um, beyond what, you know, the rest of, of the company is using. Again, that's really specific to our business needs. Are there any specific ones? Again, don't have to say the names. Any, any f- uh, types of tools, categories that like you feel like this is really something I'm using now. It's great. And 10 years ago, yeah. it didn't even exist. Um, Well, I would say actually one of the things that we've leveraged. So, you know, as you can imagine, we're a large company. So our, you know, global sales and marketing operations provide, you know, all the tools primarily that everyone needs to run their business. And then we use a lot of our own tools, like our own analytics tools, um, our SAP analytics cloud. But one of the things that we have leveraged um, and, and I think other parts of the business are leveraging, but we leveraged uniquely was our Qualtrics acquisition now um, IPO because some of the things we're looking for is we look at our business development opportunities and it's, it's not just the data we're getting from our operational systems. It's about um, the experience data we're getting from both our customers as well as from our field. And so that gives us some additional dimensions of how we're looking at things and making decisions when we're determining our business development priorities or how we're going to address other challenges in the business. Got it. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense, right? You need to use the tools that help you the most. And I think at the end of the day, if you're in sales, but of course in marketing, you're trying to automate, you're trying to scale there's no one-to-one in marketing. I know it's people think it is. There's one-to-one in marketing when we work with sales, but marketing cannot right. own one-to-one on your own. Sales, of course, owns one-to-one, and we try to bridge the gap on the one-to-few and, and help each other, which is the ABM story. Different podcast, different day, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the, 
the the way to use the tools and to be useful around creating your uh, better operational work and productive person for each AE and for each person is don't be a slave to the tools, have the tools serve you. Right. And I see it more and more that there's a HubSpot is not working well for us, Salesforce is a challenge, or I can't do this lead to, to account entities. Like, so let's find a way around it. Either we find right. another tool which breaks it all, or you, you, you can't be a slave to the tool. You've got to focus on your business approach. You know, the tools are enablers, right, for the business. The business has to continue. And the tools, and look, the tools need to become more agile. And we've seen that over the last few years. Tools have to become more agile to keep up with the pace of business. But you can't be a slave to the tool. And, um, yeah, we had this discussion around a, a new uh, a new revenue-generating segment that we created this year in one of our, in one of our segments um, and discussions around you know, the tool that supports it and how, it, you know, it, this is a little bit different than every other part of our business across the company. And so, you know, well, but okay, we're not going to be a slave to how that's done for everybody else because the business needs to move forward. And, you know, luckily we had some great support um, to get that done, but sometimes the tools hold the business back. Oh yeah, I definitely, <laughs> definitely. It's uh, when you don't have clarity and transparency, you're making decisions and don't agree in terminology. It's terrible. You know, the last thing we do on this show is we ask you to, again, it's this time it's not fairy dust or a wand. It's a, kind of like a crystal ball or like being like the superpower hero, like the Wonder Woman behind you. If you're this Wonder Woman who could be Wonder Woman consultant of to the dreams, to CEOs or founders, what is this thing that you would tell them maybe if you can come in and, and tell them like, listen, your teams and your executives might not be able to tell you this because they, they you, you have conflicts of what you're talking about, but let me tell you as a guidance, like a CEO to another CEO, what do you think that is that they would really like to know or should know about go-to-market specifically? Oh, about go-to-market specifically? Well, about anything, but go-to-market especially. So let me start with um, where I thought you were going and then I'll, um, okay, so just fine. from a, you know, having worked at large and small companies, I think sometimes um, the person that is the genius founder of a company, you know, at a certain point, people won't tell that CEO the truth or will, will you know, give them that they're surrounded with yes men who don't want to tell them the truth. And I think sometimes the person that is that genius person that takes a business to a certain level is not the person to take it to the next level. Meaning, you know, maybe they did sales and they founded the business, but now it's time to bring in a professional sales leader. Or, you know, maybe it was okay to bring in their brother for sales when they founded it in their garage and were a genius and that took off, um, you know, with crazy multiples. But now is the time, you know, you need someone who's run on sales sales organization of 500 people um, mm -hmm. or taking a company to other levels and multiples. So I think, I think it's partly just um, sometimes um, CEOs need someone who can tell them the truth and not just, um, you know, what worked in the past and got them to where they are. Is not necessarily what takes them to the next level despite yeah. amazing success they may have had? Yeah. It's, it's true. It's, you, and I guess I would then pivot that to go to market. I think it's the same thing. So what worked as a sales strategy as a starting business to a certain level, you know, it's now that you, if you become a more mature organization, it's, it's having, you know, like you said, maybe there wasn't a lot of data used in go to market as a small company. You know, they had this amazing um, solution and they had to get it out there and they hired some good salespeople and there wasn't a lot of structure to it. There wasn't a lot of thought to you know, the strategy using data around it. And after a certain level, they get to a certain level. I think you need more data around that and you need the right people. So I think, I think that, I think it changes as the company is, you know, size and inflection growth rate. Did that answer your question? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I think the bottom line is you need the right fit for purpose people at the right time. Mm -hmm. Everybody can grow with a company and it's okay to bring in other people to help them. I would, I would only say that um, the CEOs and founders of companies that are growing have never done that also. So they don't change themselves every day. Correct. What you need is to have the right people to help you go along and bring yeah. in expertise in white spaces. Right. And that we agree completely, especially in sales. Like, great, we've now moved up market and we have strategic accounts. 
Well, I don't think your SMB salespeople are going to be able to handle that. Bring in a exactly. solution consultant. Bring in, exactly. Exactly. Bring in like a forecasting expert. Bring because in because you layer partner. on more complexity, and if if your people haven't dealt with that complexity because you're originally were growing market share in an SMB area, and now you need to move upstream, it's a very different game. Exactly. I need the right people who've dealt with that, who know what the right structure is from an org structure, from a coverage ratio, from the data, and the people that they need to surround them. Yeah, absolutely. This was great. This is uh, the end of our Data Vana show, Megan. Amazing stuff. Always great to see you. Wonder Woman, and which is really what you are. You're <laughs> pretty amazing, as we've always said. All the best. And we'll be in great touch. to see you. All right. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye.